Praise the Lord. Where is up as we pray together? Heavenly Father, we bless your name for our Bible study. Thank you, Lord, for the joy of learning from you. Thank you, Lord, because of this great, deep revelation of your word. I will pray that as we learn tonight, Lord, everything you want to accomplish by the teaching of your word, you accomplish in every heart, every life, every family, and the whole church. In Jesus' name, we ask you, know, Lord, that as we study this word, we'll hide your word in our heart so that we'll not sin against you. And so that we'll become exemplary believers and a model church, even in this age and generation, in Jesus' name. What you made of this church to the Thessalonians, you'll make of every one of us in Jesus' name. In a time of temptation, make us to stand. Times of trials and affliction, Lord, we pray, we'll stand faithful to your word in Jesus' name. And keep your church clean, pure, holy, and righteous in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you very much. We're looking at the word of God tonight. Once again in 2 Thessalonians. We're reading from chapter 1. We started this 2 Thessalonians last Monday, last week. And here we have verses 4, 5, and 6. I'm going to back up and look at here from verse 1. So you can have the proper connection with what we studied before. Paul and Silvanus and Silas and Timotheus as Timothy unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. is writing to the church that came out of the world and it came into Christ. That's the meaning of the church, ecclesia. That is the people who are drawn out, out of their sin, out of self, out of the evils of society, and they are drawn unto the Lord, and now they come into Christ. That's why you have that verse of scripture, if any man be in Christ, in God, is a new creature. Old things are what? They are passed away, and then all things have become new. Concerning these believers in Thessalonica, we are told they came out of their evil, out of idolatry, out of defilement, out of everything that is satanic. And now they came into Christ. They were the church, the ecclesia, in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it tells us in verse 2, grace unto you, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. He told them about what God them said by grace are you saved and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God now they got into the kingdom by grace and they continue in that kingdom by grace and they are going to continue till the culmination till the final end all by grace because when we talk about the grace of God number one there is the saving grace that we come into the kingdom not by power not by might but by his mercy and by his love we come by grace saving grace and then the sustaining grace he keeps us in that kingdom he keeps us in that righteousness and we have sustaining grace but we don't just stop there he comes to sanctify us purify us and make us holy that's what we call sanctifying grace it says by the grace of God we are sanctified it is not by works it's not by struggling it's not by human effort it's by the grace of God but we go on because there's steadfast faith it makes us steadfast and stable in times of persecution in times of trial in times of affliction we stay there remaining faithful to the Lord there is that steadfast grace of God that keeps us steadfast and stable in the things of the Lord challenges may come I came to Paul the apostle and he went to the Lord and he said oh Lord take this away from me and the Lord said no my grace is sufficient for you you are going to find as you keep on working with the Lord that there is sufficient grace in the Lord trials but sufficient grace persecution sufficient grace and then the pressure and the pain of life coming upon your life there is sufficient grace that is there and then he talks about the super abundant grace of God and so as Paul the apostle was writing to these eternal believers he said grace unto you whatever measure of grace you need whatever area of grace you need and whatever level of grace you need grace unto you and peace from God our father 
when that grace comes, then it comes to the peace of God being justified by faith. We have peace with God. The enmity is taken away. The division, the separation is taken away. And now we're reconciled with God and therefore we have peace with God. We also have peace in ourselves because all the restlessness and the fear of torment and the fear of judgment on the final day, all that is taken away. And now there's peace within and peace around and peace above and peace even beneath that all through your life you wake up in the morning the peace of God is there you're relating with people the peace of God is there and that peace continues and then you make an effort to keep that peace and unity of the people of God because you follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord and so that peace of God that begins at salvation continues peace like a river overflowing in our lives in our families and also in the church of the living God and all this grace and all this peace is coming from the Father all this grace and all this peace is coming from the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior and now Paul the Apostle said I'm thanking God for you Thessalonian believers because they were like I told you an exemplary church they were like I told you a model church and because of the example of their lives and because of the pattern of their lives that's why he said we're bound to thank God always for you he couldn't say that about every church you know the church of the Corinthians he couldn't say that about them the church of the Galatians couldn't said that about them but concerning the church of the Thessalonians he said we're bound to give thanks and praise unto God because of you and we do that every time brethren as it is reasonable and meet or suitable because that your faith grows exceedingly and the charity the love of every one of you toward each other abounded because of their faith and because of their love and because of the practical Christian life that they had he said we're thanking God for for you. Paul the Apostle was so well pleased with this church of the Thessalonians. It was a significant church, a church to be thankful to God for. The church was a good example for others to follow. And Paul spoke about this church in all the other churches. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, so that we ourselves glory in you. We rejoice in you. We're proud of you. We're thankful for you so that we ourselves we glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that she endure. He said, we're talking about you every time and we're lifting you up as a very good example, a very good model to all the other churches. Yes, they were going through persecution, affliction, and the pressures of the world. The people that didn't love them because they became righteous, they left idolatry, they left all those pollutions of the world, and they left all those defilements of the world, and because of that pressure came and pain came and persecution came afflictions came but they were steadfast in the Lord that's why he was thanking God for they said for your patience that's what patience means perseverance you are persistent you stay in there and you're resilient I just say nothing is going to shake us we're not going to go back to Egypt or go back to idolatry and the same kind of tough mindedness the Lord wants you to have so that whatever the challenges against your life because of your Christian faith faith you say i'm going to endure to the very end you're going to endure in jesus name and then the people of god our pastors and our leaders like paul like silas like timothy will be praising god for you that the persecutions have not destroyed your faith because your faith will be indestructible in jesus name their conversion was genuine and they had received the word of god not as a word of men but as it is in truth the word of god though they were tempted and tried severely. They remained steadfast in their faith and in their love and in their hope. In their faith of seeing the Lord on the final day, their deep love for God and practical love one for another revealed how they had been taught of God. There was no doubt in the redemptive reality of the experience in Christ because the apostles testified concerning them. He said, ye are all the children of light. And I pray that that same testimony, somebody will look at your life and he'll say there's no area that is dark 
There's no area that is demonic. There's no area that is deceptive. There's no area that is defiled. And then he's praising God for you that you are truly a child of God walking in the light. The apostle then was always thankful on their behalf because of the increase and the growth of their Christian virtues despite the growing persecution, the growing affliction. What virtues are we talking about? They have faith, the virtue of faith, they had love, that's the virtue of love, and they had hope and peace, they had righteousness and patience, they had knowledge, the knowledge of the word of the Lord, and temperance, that is self-control, and they manifested godliness and brotherly kindness. All these were consistently growing, even though the hostility against them and the persecution against them was also growing more intense continually every day, yet they remained faithful. And I want to say, that same grace God gave unto them, that same grace the Lord will give to you. That your real conversion, your genuine conversion will shine forth by the power of the Lord in Jesus' name. Come back to that verse 4 again. It says, so that we ourselves glory in you. And we say that about you. When we look at your life, we look at your behavior, we look at your character, we look at the demonstration of your faith and knowledge and love and hope and everything. Can the people of God that interact with you, that know you day after day, can they say that we we ourselves glory in you. Can they show you as a real model to other people and say, look at him, look at her, look at his Christian life and look at her Christian life. And if you're looking for an example to follow, look at an example to follow. That's what Paul the apostle was happy to do concerning the uh, children of God in Thessalonica. And that's what we are going to do about your life too, in Jesus' name. So that we ourselves glory in you. In the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that she endured. And you need to understand that examples are very strong. Examples are very significant. You know, many times as we teach the word of God, the new converts, uh, they understand that or documentally. They understand the word of God uh, just superficially, but then they see that word demonstrated in your life. The faith, the trust, the confidence in God, and the love you have towards each other. Then they begin to say, uh -huh, that is what we learned the other Sunday, that's what we learned the other Monday, that's what we learned the other Tuesday, and because of the demonstration in your life, they're able to pin that teaching, that doctrine, that word of God on this rock, on this pin, on this uh, milestone, because they can see it manifested in your life. That's why you need to live by the word of God and set a good example because of the people that are watching you and that are looking at your life, especially when you are under persecution, when the pressure is there, when the pain is there, because their own time too will come. Then they will remember that's how brother so and so endured, that's how I remained faithful, that's how sister so and so endured in a Christian life in a marriage, in a family, when the fire was hot, when the home was hot, that's how she remained faithful unto the Lord. And then your example will lead them to be faithful to the Lord. I pray that that will be your pattern of life in Jesus' name. So that people will not say, well, who am I? After all, when they same persecution came to so and so, he couldn't stand and he was in the faith before me. If he couldn't stand, how can I stand? And sister so and so, when this challenge came in her life, she couldn't stand and who am I to be able to stand when she could not stand you will not be a source of discouragement and defeat and downfall to other people you'll be a source of encouragement uplifting other people that the courage that you manifest the resilience you manifest and the power and the temerity all the top mindedness you, you uh, demonstrate all that will encourage other people they will do that too in Jesus name and uh, look at this in verse 5 which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that she may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. And they were suffering. The need was for the kingdom of God. It wasn't for any bad thing that they had done. It was for the kingdom of God. They were suffering and they were going to remain there faithful until the very end. Now when we enter the kingdom of God by faith, by grace, by that initial experience of salvation as we get into that kingdom the kingdoms of this world world will not appreciate that you have come into the kingdom of God because of that the citizens of the kingdom of the world they may persecute you but then you're not going to allow them to drive you back will you? 
No, they will not drive you back, but you are going to remain faithful to the very end. In verse 6, it says, Sin, it is a righteous sin with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. The Lord is saying there that he will recompense tribulation and trouble and also punishment and, you know, a lot of indignation and judgment upon those people that bring persecution upon the believers except they repent. We are praying that they will repent in Jesus' name. We're looking at the study tonight. We're looking at living righteously during persecution. Living righteously during persecution. Times of affliction. Living righteously. Times of adversity. Living righteously. Times of difficulty. Living righteously. And times of poverty. Living righteously. And times when the challenges are very great. And you say, what am I going to do? What direction am I going to go? And when it appears that there is not enough to spend, not enough to eat, and there's not enough to clothe with, and there's not enough to make use of at that time of difficulty and challenge, that you live a righteous life. It's easy to almost you know, to live righteous when everything is going well. When there's a job, there's a house, there's a wife, there's a husband, there are children, there's a good pay, there's promotion. Everybody is saying, well done, and they praise you. Everybody hovering around you and appreciating it. But it's when the difficulties are there. When the opposition is there, when the difficulties are mounting up, that's the time the Lord is challenging us at that time of adversity, affliction, and persecution that will live a righteous life. I pray that the grace to do so and the faith to do so and the passion and the pursuit of righteousness to be able to live such a life the Lord will give to you in Jesus name as we look at this study on living righteously during persecution we're going to divide to three parts number one patience and faith reassurance during persecution the patience the perseverance the persistence the steadfastness and the faith Having that assurance during persecution. Number two, punishment and frightening recompense for the persecutors. The persecutors shouldn't think that you know they'll go scot-free, opposing God, opposing Christ, opposing the kingdom of God, and discouraging the people of God on their way to heaven. They shouldn't think that everything is all right, and whatever they do, even if they discourage people, make people backslide, and put pressure upon people, and the persecution upon people, that it doesn't matter at all. It matters, because there's going to be punishment and frightful frightening recompense for those persecutors but now number three is the promise and the future rewards for those who are persecuted if you're persecuted and you're meaning faithful to the lord there's going to be a future reward for you in jesus name even in this life even in this life the reward will be there the promises of god are sure they have steadfast that when you're persecuted for righteousness sake because of the son of man you're persecuted and you're remaining right it says in this life there is a promise of a great, great rewards for you and then in the life to come to you a great, great promise. We're looking at it number one now. Patience and faith, reassurance during persecution. We're looking at verse 4. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. We're looking at it from verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. As it tells us that it was glorying in them, it was rejoicing in them, it was bragging on them, it was proud of them, it was recommending them to all the churches, all the other churches he had planted. That's because of their spiritual growth. And because of their spiritual progress, this church they caused Paul and his companions in ministry so much joy Joy. They desire that all the other churches will be like this model church. So they spoke about the church everywhere. They said, well, you know, we know the grace of God is still there. We know that God has not changed. And we know that Jesus Christ is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we know that what he's doing in other people, he can do you. Then they'll bring out the example and the model of the church of the Thessalonians. What if we look at your local church and then we're looking for righteousness we know it's there. At purity, we know it's there. We're looking at faith, we know it's there. And we're looking at standing firm and standing steadfast until the day of the Lord, we know it's there. And we're looking at your commitment in evangelism, commitment in church planting, commitment in obeying the word and the will of the Lord. And we know it is there. Then we go to other local churches, other districts and other regions and other states. And then we're pointing back at your church. We're pointing back at your local church and we're saying, praise the Lord. We know that if God 
God can do it for you, then he can do it for these other people too. That's the example we ought to lay. That's the model we ought to set. And then you as an individual believer too, as we're talking about the whole church, we're also talking about your own life, that we're saying, if God is able to do it in Enoch, he can do it in you. If we're able to do it in Daniel, he can do it in you. And like those individual believers from the time of Enoch to Noah and to Joseph and all the other people, like we're models and real examples, we'll be able to single you out and pull you out and say, look at him. If God can do that in his life, God can do it in every life. God can do it in my life, can do it in your life. We'll do it in our lives in Jesus' name. And you should always try to be an example. Don't think, you know, I'm all alone. I cannot bear this anymore. This is going to crush me. And then I give up. I say goodbye. I'm going home because I cannot do anything anymore. Others are looking at you. And the model you said, the example you said, is so very important. Like these certain believers, the model they said before the other people, the church, had remained steadfast and full of faith. Despite the persecutions, they were enduring. It was a church that was commended and recommended to all the churches. They were not commended for anything physical, anything temporal, but for their perseverance and their steadfast faith in the Lord. Persecution could not destroy their faith. If your faith is genuine, persecution will not destroy it. If your love is genuine, persecution will not destroy it. If your salvation is genuine, persecution, opposition, temptation will not destroy that salvation, will just bring out the beauty and the glory of the Lord in your life. That's what it did for them because their faith was genuine. Their faith was real. That's why their faith was not destroyed because it, was, it came from the very throne of God and whatever came from the very hand of God, Satan will not be able to destroy it in Jesus' name. Upon this rock, tell me the rest, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not destroy it. What does that mean? The gates of hell shall not be able to destroy the faith of that church or the love of that church or the virtues of that church or the righteousness in that church. Like he said that for the church, he's saying that for the individual. Upon this rock, I will build the life of this individual believer and the gates of hell shall not be able to destroy him. He's saying that about your Christian family to husband, wife, and children that the husband is born again, the wife is born again, the children are born again and they're standing firm in the Lord. Even during the society in the community that may be persecution against them, and yet upon this rock I built this Christian family and the gates of hell shall not prevail against that Christian family in Jesus name. From the time of the conversion of these thousand believers, they lived by faith and they walked by faith and they stood steadfast in the faith and they endured all things by faith and they remained faithfully obedient to the word of the Lord. And that's why he was commending them and that's the reason why too your life will be commendable in Jesus name. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 13. Let's see what helped them. How could they be so steadfast? How could they be so dedicated unto the Lord? How could they live so steadfastly in dedication to the word of the Lord and according to the word of righteousness and holiness and purity and there was no stain of sin, no stain of defilement in their lives because they took the word of God serious when the word of God came to them. They didn't say, eh, that's the message of uh, so and so. That's the preaching of so and so. That's the idea of so and so. They didn't take the word of God as the word of men. They took it in reality as it is in truth, the word of the Lord. Look at First Thessalonians chapter two, verse thirteen. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. They believe the word of God. And because they took it, they said, this is God talking to me. This is my heavenly father talking to me. This is Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, the very son of God talking to me. That's the way they took the word of God. They didn't say, well, I'm going to the Bible.
Bible study, the pastor is teaching the Bible study. Uh, da, da, you, know, you know what the pastor said? You know what so and so said? No. They said that is the very word of God. It's coming from the throne of God and it's coming to my heart. And because of the way he took that word, that's why it worked effectually in them because they believe. Look at verse 14. When they now received that word of God, what came out of that? What was the result of that? Persecution. In verse 14 it says, For ye brethren, became followers of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, of your own countrymen. Sometimes the persecution is right in your family. If, uh, you know, you have believed and the members of the family, they have not believed, they challenge every conviction you have. They challenge every truth that you hold. And they challenge every doctrine that you are standing on. But never mind, it happened to the Thessalonians that way too. Sometimes it's the extended family. That this little family is standing upon the word of God, but the extended family, they say, we have heard that you are no more following the family religion we have heard you're no more following the rituals and the ceremonies and all the outings of the extended family and then persecution will come sometimes it's in the community that you know all the other people living there they see that you are different you're not living like they're living you're not saying what they're saying and you're not going the way they're going and you're not trying to eat and drink what they're eating and drinking and because of that lifestyle different in appearance and different in dressing and different in behavior and different in the way your family is because of that righteous principle by which you live. That's why the persecution came by your own countrymen. You know what? When you're persecuted by strangers you never knew, you're persecuted by somebody who's never close to you, just meet them once in a while and they persecute you, it doesn't really matter to you. You say, well, it's, he doesn't really know me. He doesn't appreciate me. He's a stranger to me. I'm a stranger to him and therefore never mind what he says. But when somebody is very close to you, unfortunately like a wife, like a husband, like a child, like a father, like a mother, like a sister, like a brother, like somebody you grew up with when they persecute you. Very, very painful. But even though these people were persecuted, their countrymen, by the people they knew and loved and appreciated very much, yet they said, well, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. And it is that spiritual ignorance that is making them to bring that persecution. Therefore, they stood firm. And when your own time comes, that the people who are very, very close to you, friends who are close to you, relatives who are close to you, when persecution comes through them, I pray you will stand in Jesus' name. I said they will stand in Jesus' name. Look at verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? And not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. For ye are our glory and joy. That's how it was with them. That is how it will be with us in Jesus' name. In Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 3. And not only so. But we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Paul the apostle came to the point, you know, when you are just a new convert and there's a little difficulty, that pains you to the marrow. And then you might murmur, you might complain, you might grumble, you might cry, you might go to God and say, God, why is this happening to me? Why is that happening to me? But then as you grow in your Christian faith, as you grow in your Christian life, as you grow in understanding of the word of God, you know that this persecution, tribulation is going to bring a great reward for you here on earth and also in eternity. Now you rejoice even in that tribulation and then whenever there's no persecution, when people are not doing something against you, you are wondering what's happening? What's happening? Am I not living by the word of God anymore? Why is it like even the unbelievers and the drunkards and the liars and the smokers and the prostitutes and everybody everybody is speaking well of me something must be wrong here. But when you're a real child of God and those who are in darkness, they're possible because you're the light. It gives you joy because it's a testimony to your Christian faith that you are different and it is that difference in your life that is bringing the persecution. That's why it says not only so but we glory we rejoice, we exalt even that tribulation knowing that the tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost 
Ghost which is given unto us. And then when that Holy Ghost abides within and remains within us, it strengthens us, energizes us, empowers us, and give, builds a wall of resistance around us so that all those persecutions and all those tribulations and all those trials and afflictions, they matter not at all. It strengthens your muscle. It's like when people, when athletes are doing exercise, you'll be looking at them. How could they endure that? How could they stand all that? All the running, all the punching, all the beating and everything is strengthening their muscles because of all the things coming at them. The same thing, the persecution. When the persecution is coming at you, it's strengthening your spiritual muscle. You become stronger. You become greater. You become taller. And then, any other little thing that comes to say, praise the Lord. The Lord has strengthened my spiritual muscles. And because of that, I can stand and you will stand. Look at chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 12. Chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 12 of Romans. It says in verse 12, rejoicing in hope and patient in tribulation and continuing instant in prayer. It says that during that persecution, you'll not be in a hurry. You'll not be like the children of Israel that backslid because of persecution, because of difficulties in the wilderness. Every time there's a little challenge, every, little, every time there's a little difficulty, then they want to choose a captain and go back to Egypt. They want to go back to drink the waters of Egypt and then to eat all the cucumbers in Egypt and then to go to see all their friends in Egypt because of that little difficulty, you're not like them. It says that you are patient in tribulation. You are patient in persecution. And you are moving on in the Lord. In verse 13, distributing to the necessity of saints and giving to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. You know, your character is a character of love. Even though the persecutors are there and they're doing all they can do against your life, they curse you, you bless them. They oppress you, you release them. And whatever they do that is negative, you do something positive, even towards them. In verse 15, it says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that do weep. That means that even though you're persecuted and afflicted and there's adversity there, all the same when you see other people who are suffering, any level of suffering, you're sympathizing with them, you're taking care of them because your nature has been changed. It says, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Condescend to, uh, to men of low estate. You know, when you're a real believer, you're not all the time conscious of who you are, how rich I am, how great I am, educated I am. I am doctor so and so. I have this great certificate and this profession. And then we look down on the other people that didn't go to college. We look down upon other people that are not rich. You condescend to men of low estate. You will not say I cannot worship there because that place is lowly. Look at my position. You're able to interact with other people and mix with other people and fellowship with other people because what's important to you is not the money you have. It's the blood of Jesus that cleansed you and washed you from your sin. What's important is not your doctorate degree. What's important is not your profession. What's important is not all the superficial things which we are going to leave behind when we die. What's important is your faith in the Lord and the grace of God in you and in that poor man. In you and in that illiterate woman. In you and everybody else. Because of that you exalt the thing that ought to be exalted. That's why it says that to condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits, recompense to no man, evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, if it be possible, as much as lies in you. Tell me the rest. Live peaceably with how many people? All men, difficult men, live peaceably with them. And you know, treacherous men, live peaceably with them. And the people that are always looking for trouble, if there's no trouble, they try to create trouble and try to stir up trouble, live peaceably with them. As much as it lies in you, show that you have the Prince of Peace living inside you. And because of that Prince of Peace living inside you, it's giving you peace in salvation and peace in sanctification and peace all within and all around you and if the peace is within you are not going to be looking for trouble outside it says you are going to live at peace peaceably with all men it says dearly beloved avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath for it is written vengeance is mine I will repay says the Lord therefore if thine enemy hunger do what? cause him 
punish him, strike him, pray against him to die, never to get work, die, die, die. I need to die. What do you do? If your enemy hunger, tell me, feed him. How many Christians are doing that today? As we look at churches springing up, church there and church there and church there, what do we do? How do we take care of the people that afflict us? And the people that persecute us? And the people that cause us suffering? And the people that cause us heartache? And the people that they want to double cross your way and just hinder you from moving forward? What do you do to them? It says that if we're real children of God and we have the peace of God in us and we have our eyes on the future and we know that we're on our way to heaven, that what you do is if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, what do you do? Give him drink. Then it says, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil. If they hate you and you hate them back, you are overcome of evil. If somebody does something against you and then you do it back against them, you overcome with evil. If somebody is unfaithful to you, and then you say, uh, uh, see what he has done. It's unfaithful to me. All right, I'm going to go out and be unfaithful to her, unfaithful to him. It means then you overcome of evil. But it says, be not overcome of evil, but do what? Overcome evil with good. That's the Christian life. We're going to live in that Christian life. And that is what Paul the Apostle saw in these certain believers. That's why I was praising God for them. And that is what we're seeing in you. Many of us who have suffered persecution were standing and will remain standing and then we are praising God for each other in Jesus name in Hebrews chapter 10 I'm reading from verse 34 it says in verse 34 for ye had compassion of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance that's why we're enduring that's why we're standing that's why we remain steadfast because we know that we have in heaven that reward and we have that great Great sin, the Lord is preparing for us in heaven. That they sin, whatever is coming in our way, we're able to endure to the very end. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, perseverance, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the judge shall live. How? By faith, but if any man draw back, if any man draw back, if any man draw back, I will not draw back. I said, I will not draw back. You know, if you are saved and then you give up salvation, that's drawing back. If you are saved and you believe in sanctification, and then because of the problem, I don't believe sanctification anymore. Uh, holiness is not possible anymore. I've done everything I could do. This holiness, purity of heart, sanctification not possible. That's drawing back. If you were doing evangelism because, you know, the Lord has saved you and blessed you and given you the word and the fire is there, the passion, and then you have some little, little difficulties and come, you say, I cannot do that anymore. I cannot evangelize last anymore. That's drawing back. But it says we're not of them that draw back. We're of the people that are moving forward unto the saving of the soul in Jesus' name. And it's telling us in First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 I'm reading there from verse 5. Persecution, yes. Trials, yes. Affliction, yes. But in all these things we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who has loved us and given himself for us. In First Peter chapter 1, I read from verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice. Do now, for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness from manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. Think about that. You think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their faith was tested by fire, tried by fire. And you think of Daniel. He was tried and tested in the lion's den. And you think about Joseph. He was unjustly thrown into 
the prison, even though your faith is even tried by fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. It's through this kind of a steadfastness in persecution that are going to remain faithful and you will remain faithful to the very end in Jesus name. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 14 I'm reading from verse 21 Acts of the Apostles chapter 14 see what it says in verse 21 it says and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch confirming the souls of the disciples. Those are the people who have been born again. The people that have given themselves to the Lord and Paul the apostle with all the other ministers who are confirming them, establishing them, encouraging them that they continue in the Lord and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained, established and appointed and anointed them elders in every church and had prayed were fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. That same thing is what the Lord is expecting of you and expecting of me that whatever the trial or persecution or whatever the pain or the pressure upon us will continue. We're going to continue to the very end in Jesus' name. Point number two now. Punishment and frightening recompense for persecutors. Punishment and frightening recompense for the persecutors. We're looking at Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 5 and verse 6. Verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. A manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. Judgment is going to come upon the persecutors. They might do it for a time. They might do it for a moment. They might do it for the present time. But when the final judgment will come, great indignation and great wrath and great punishment will come upon them because they had a bad heart, bad attitude. They hated righteousness. They were enemies of the righteous and haters of righteousness. And because they hated righteousness and they hated purity and they hated the name of Jesus Christ and they hated the people that were saved, because of that, they manifested their hatred towards that salvation. Hatred towards righteousness. Hatred towards those who are walking righteously in the kingdom of God. That's why it is saying there's going to be the manifestation of the righteous judgment of God upon them. Look at verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous sin with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. That is the people that persecute you, the people that persecute believers, there's going to be addition upon them. And I pray that when that time will come, you will not be among the people that are going to receive judgment, but you'll be receiving reward in Jesus' name. In Philippians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 28. Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 28. Remember, persecutors are going to be punished. Remember, if they don't repent, they're going to be punished. The people that know to do right and they don't do it. Instead of encouraging the righteous, encouraging those who are saved, encouraging those who are in the kingdom of God, they're trying to discourage them and drive them back. Instead of encouraging the people that are sold to the Lord and giving to the Lord, they're trying to destroy them with the pressure and the pain and the persecution and all those afflictions they lay upon them. The word of God is saying that Though evil men do evil with both hands, and it appears that there's no punishment, on the final day there's going to be indignation and wrath and punishment upon them. Philippians chapter 1, verse 28. And in nothing be terrified by your adversaries. That's what the adversaries want. They want you to be afraid of them more than you're afraid of God. They want you to bow to them more than you bow to the Lord. They want to capture you and keep you in captivity rather than you being a captive of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, but the Lord is saying, there are nobody. Think about Pharaoh. 
He came and he's gone. And seek about Sennacherib, he came and now he's gone. And seek about Nebuchadnezzar, he came and now he's gone. Think about Herod, and he came and now he's gone. And think about Church Israel, think about Nero. Now he's come and gone. That's why, because they are men of yesterday and they will soon perish, and the judgment of God is going to be upon them. That's why it says, Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of any man, any woman, whatever their power, whatever their authority, and whatever they think they can do. Never be afraid of anyone. That's why it says, Nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And when suffering comes, we're going to stay there. I said we're going to stay there and we're going to remain steadfast to the end in Jesus name and then you'll not be cringing and then you'll not be bending and buying and changing your standard and changing your conviction because of the persecutors when you stand firm like that the persecutor knows that it doesn't have any power to torment you, it doesn't have any power to make you afraid and because there's no fear in that persecution or torment, that's the reason why they become afraid eventually you transfer the fear on them and instead of you being afraid. They are the people that be afraid of you in Jesus' name. You know, in the final analysis, it was, uh, you know, Pharaoh that was afraid of the children of God in Israel. In the final analysis, it was Nebuchadnezzar that was afraid of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And finally, it was, you know, Herod that was afraid of uh, the people of God at the time of Christ. And that's what the Lord is saying when you take your stand. And then when you go through what you are going through courageously, instead of you being afraid, they will be afraid of you and afraid of the cause of Christ in Jesus' name. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. He said that you are not the only one suffering. The apostle Paul too was going through some things and if he went through, then you can go through and we can go through together in Jesus' name. We're looking at Psalm 94. Psalm 94, I'm reading from verse 20. Psalm 94, verse 20. The punishment that comes upon the persecutors and the frightening recompense Pains and wrath and indignation that comes upon the persecutors because they are heaping for themselves wrath and indignation against the day of judgment. Psalm 94, I'm reading from verse 20. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous. That's what persecutors do. You are righteous because of that. They gather together. They have a kind of conspiracy against you. It says they gather together against the soul of the righteous and they condemn the innocent blood. But the Lord is my defense. The Lord will be your defense. And my God is the rock of my refuge and he shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. He cut Pharaoh off, he'll cut them off. He cut off Nebuchadnezzar and he spent seven seasons, years, he spent all that time like animals in the forest, he'll cut them off. And like Herod, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, they cut him off. The same God is still there. And he brings punishment and wrath and judgment upon the evil doers. And because God has not changed what he did in days gone by, is he going to do today? Except they repent, the judgment of God will come upon them. I pray you will not wait until that judgment will come upon you but that you allow the goodness of the Lord and the patience of the Lord and the love of the Lord and the proclamation of the salvation of the Lord and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. You allow that to lead you to repentance. We're looking at Romans chapter 2. In Romans chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4 there that if you have been persecuting the righteous, you have been doing things that are wrong, you've been living in sin and living in a tyranny and wickedness and evil and oppression and you've seen nothing has happened it's just the patience of God. If you don't repent, you might find that that judgment comes suddenly without any remedy. Romans chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that 
the goodness of God leadest thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That's New Testament telling us that there is wrath, telling us there is judgment, telling us there is perdition. And telling us there's going to be the indignation of the mighty wrath of God on the final day. It says in verse 6, who will render to every man according to his deeds. He'll render to every man, render to every child, and render to every woman, render to everyone according as their deeds are. If you are not saved, you are still of the flesh, and you're persecuting the people that are in the Lord in the spirit. It says he's going to render to you according to your deeds to them who by patient continuance in well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life it says those who have been born again and because they are born again they are going patiently and they're following after the lord and they're doing that consistently living righteously because of the grace of god and salvation coming upon their lives it says there's going to be the life eternal and the joy and the reward of the lord for eternity but look at verse 8 but unto them that are contentious unto them who do not obey the truth unto them who only will be on righteousness there will be indignation and wrath. Verse 9 tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Whether he does it publicly or does it privately whether he gives a reason for doing it is because so and so did evil to me as I'm doing evil back. Whatever the justification it says upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Every soul of man living in sin, every soul of man that rejects the salvation of the Lord, there's going to be tribulation, there's going to be anguish, and then it says the Jew force and also to the Gentile, but glory and honor and peace to every man that walketh good to the Jew false and also to the Greek. It says in verse 11, for there is no respect of persons with God. No respect of persons with God. That is the same standard he uses in judging A. That same standard is going to use in judging B. And the same standard he uses in judging the Jews. That same standard is going to use in judging the Gentiles. And therefore the only thing we can do to escape that judgment of God is to repent. And I pray that that spirit of repentance the Lord will give to everyone in Jesus name I want you to look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 verses 30 and 31 the day of reckoning is coming and the day of recompense is coming the day of judgment is coming that's why the Lord is saying that if you have not repented this is the time to repent because the mercy of the Lord is still available the goodness of the Lord is still available and the compassion of the Lord is still available almost like it's inexhaustible but the day is coming when the door of mercy will close when the day of grace will be over before that day of grace is over the Lord is saying if you are not saved yet come in if you are not born again yet come in and repent of your sin and call upon the name of the Lord so that salvation will be yours look at chapter 17 of Acts verse 30. In verse 30 it says, and the times of this ignorant God winked at. The times of this ignorant. You cannot claim ignorance anymore. You have heard that Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary. You cannot claim to be ignorant anymore. You have heard that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You cannot claim that I'm ignorant. I don't know the way of salvation. Of course you know. You cannot be ignorant anymore because it says, let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man is thought and let him return unto the Lord and then the Lord will have mercy upon him and then he will abundantly pardon. You cannot say I didn't know, I'm ignorant, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. He says come now and let us reason together says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, he says they shall be as white as snow and though they be red like crimson, he'll make them as white as wool. The times of ignorance, all that is gone and now he says but now commandeth how many people? In how many places? Everywhere. All men everywhere to repent. Now he commands young and old men and women, educated and illiterate, those who are high and those who are low. Now he commands every man everywhere, all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. That's the point. Judgment is coming. 
The wrath of God will come upon the unbelievers, upon the sinners, upon the people that are repentant. It says, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge all the secrets of men. He'll do that in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. And I pray that you'll not wait too late in Jesus' name. While the door of his mercy is still open. Will you not call upon him today? Will you not say I've counted the cause. I repent. I turn away from all my evil. And then the peace of God will settle in your heart and the spirit of God will be a witness with your heart that you are now a child of God. And the grace of God will overflow and then that new life, eternal life, a change of life transformation will happen in your life. Then you'll be able to testify, I went to the cross all my bodies of sin are offloaded on the Lord and I have taken everything away, I'm born again I'm saved and the spirit of God gives me the joy of salvation and the victory that comes with that salvation if it has not happened before, it will happen tonight and then when it happens to go out of this place rejoicing of the joy of salvation and in your life will be manifested in your life in first peter chapter 4 verse 12 beloved think it not strange concerning the very trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you if you didn't uh, have this study if you didn't treat this a uh, word of god anytime there's persecution it will surprise you it will look like a strange thing what have i done wrong all I'm doing is living by the standard of the word of God. Why are they persecuting me? All I'm doing is that I've made all my restitution. The things I stole before, I restored them. Why are they persecuting me? All I'm doing is that now I'm faithful to my employers. I'm now faithful in my place of work. What have I done wrong that they're persecuting me? If you didn't treat this word of God, that those in darkness will persecute those who are in the light. If you didn't treat this word of the Lord, that those who are born of the flesh will persecute those who are born of the spirit. It was so Surprise you. You'll be crying and complaining, but now you don't have to cry. You don't have to complain because it says in verse 12, beloved, think it not strange concerning the very trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. It says that time of reward is coming. The time of rejoicing is coming and a time of crowning coronation is coming and at that time when God begins to give reward to the people that stayed steadfast in persecution that time the day of your joy will come now in verse 14 if he be reproached and persecuted and insulted and abused and punished and pressured for the name of Christ appear ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you on their part. He is evil spoken of on your part. He is glorified. Just make sure that the pattern of your life brings glory to God. The pattern of your behavior brings glory to God. That as a child of God, reproach is coming, persecution is coming, affliction is coming. Just make sure it's not because of any bad thing that you have done. Just make sure you are walking consistently and righteously and holily and justly in a sanctified mode of life and make sure that you are living a according to the word of the Lord. Then if persecution comes, you say, well, praise the Lord. The persecution is not coming because I'm evil, because I'm sinful, because I'm defiled, because I'm doing anything wrong. It's because they hate the Christ in me. They hate the conviction I have. They hate the purity and the life of righteousness and holiness that I'm living. They hate the doctrine I'm preaching. That's why they're persecuting me. Then it says in verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief was an evil doer, was a busy body in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, understand, we as Christians, we may suffer, suffer unjustly. Christ, our Savior, Christ, our Lord, Christ, our forerunner, Christ, our Redeemer, he suffered unjustly too. And if we are Christians, if we are his disciples, if we are following after Christ, the disciple is not greater than the master. And the learner is not greater than the teacher. If he has suffered, we would suffer too. That's why it says, but if you suffer as a follower of Christ, if you suffer as a new creature, if you suffer as a saved soul, if you suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God. 
God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them be that will be not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear. If the judgment is going to start in the house of God, where will the sinner be? And where will the backslider be? And where will those people be that will be not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? I pray you'll not be among the sinners. You'll not be among the righteous. You'll not be among the backsliders. And then those who suffer as a result of their evil deeds, I pray that you'll not be your Lord. In Revelation chapter 11, Revelation chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 17 and verse 18. Judgment is going to come upon the righteous. Judgment is going to come upon the persecutors. And that will be the time of joy and rejoicing and crown and a time of glory and reward for the people that actually love the Lord, know the Lord, and are following after the Lord. Revelation chapter 11 verse 17 same. We give thee thanks O Lord God Almighty which art and washed and art come because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned the Lord will reign. And it says and the nations were angry and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they shall be judged, and that thou shouldest give the reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroyed the earth. That is when the Lord is rewarding those who have done right, and those who have lived righteously, and those who have actually followed after the Lord. At that time, he's rewarding his own children. He'll be punishing, and he'll be uh, kind of rewarding with punishment those people that have done evil. We're coming back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I'm reading verse 5 there. We need the second part of verse 5. Promises of future rewards for the persecuted. You have been born again and because of that you are persecuted, there are promises of reward for you. And then you have been living a righteous life, a glorious life, a life that is bringing glory unto the Lord. In this life, the Lord is going to reward you and in the life to come, of course, there is going to be a wonderful reward upon your life. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 5. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, and I'm reading there from verse 5. It says, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Notice that, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. The word ye there is referring to you. And the youth there is talking about those who are born again. Because except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And to be counted worthy to enter the kingdom of God and to enjoy the riches and the glory and the manifestation of the kingdom of God, we must have been born again. Look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 3. To be in the kingdom of God, to enjoy the kingdom of God, to enter the kingdom of God, and to have all those benefits of the kingdom here in this life and in the world to come, you must be born again. John chapter 3, and I'm reading there from verse 3. It says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see. The kingdom of God. I know you've been coming to the Bible study and we rejoice for your coming. We appreciate your coming. Keep on coming. But I must ask you, since you've been coming, are you born again? Are you just having the knowledge in your head and not in your heart? Have you repented of your sin? Have you turned unto the Lord? Is there a new life in you? And do you have the spirit of God bearing witness in your heart that you're a real child of God? Has your life changed? Has your character changed? Are you having the testimony that you are really born again? Can your neighbors testify that man is a changed man? That woman is a changed woman? And can the friends that knew you before, the people that are very close to you, your confidence, do they know that that's a changed man? That's a changed woman. His life is turned around. Her life is turned around. He's a new creature. She's a new creature in Christ. 
that is what it takes being born again except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god look at verse 5 jesus answered verily i say unto thee except a man be born of water that's the cleansing of the word of god you are cleansed of the word which has spoken unto you the cleansing of the water of the word he purges you and purifies you and cleanses you and makes you clean within and without in your life in the private in your life in the public there's that cleansing of the blood of the lamb and of the word of the lord and then by the spirit the oppression of the spirit of god cleansing you rejuvenating you renewing your life as that happened if that has not happened i come to the bible study i come to you everybody comes other people are coming to you it's the change that has taken place that's what matters is the transformation that has taken place that is what matters it is that new creature that new life that has taken place in your life that's what god is looking for that's why it says be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own self because if a man be a hearer of the word and is not a doer of the word this man deceiveth himself but he that looks at the law of liberty looks at the word of god and then this word works effectually in him making a transformation Formation a change that man shall be blessed indeed of all his words. That's why it says, Ye must be born again. Look at verse 6. It says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That is, the works of the flesh they will do. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. And I pray that you'll not live here without having that experience of being born again in Jesus' name. And then when the persecution is coming upon the people that uh, do not know the Lord, I pray that in your own case, it will not be persecution, it will not be punishment, it will be the promise of God being fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. But it means that the works of the flesh must totally be cancelled and the fruit of the spirit must be in your life. Look at Galatians chapter 5. So you you know the people we are talking about those who are born again this is what you see in their lives the works of the flesh gone all those evil things gone morning afternoon evening and night all that is totally changed look at chapter 5 verse 19 it says now the works of the flesh are manifest this is what you find in those who are not born again yet the only study the bible in the head it has not transformed their hearts i pray this will not be your story I said, this will not be your story. The people that look at you, the people that see you, the people that interact with you day after day, they listen to your talk, they look at your life, they look at your pattern, they look at everything that you do from morning till evening, every time you're outside, every time you're with them, they can see your life. Here is what they're going to see if you're not born again. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, and wrath, and strife, that's fighting, heresies, and seditions, envies, and murders, and drunkenness, and revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time pass that they which do such things tell me the rest shall not inherit the kingdom of god but if you are counted worthy to inherit the kingdom the kingdom of our lord jesus christ and the kingdom of god our father it means that all those works of the flesh they are gone and thank god they are gone I say, thank God they are gone. And any people are looking for them, they're looking for adultery. They say, don't look here. By the grace of God, you are born again and all that is gone. They're looking for fornication. They say, don't look here because all that now is gone. They're looking for idolatry and defilement. They say, no, come on, look in here because now this life is changed and turned around. And because of that grace of God in your life, everything is turned around and transformed in Jesus' name. And what are they going to look for when they see your life? If you're really born again, if you're totally made new and you are transformed what are they going to see look at it in verse 22 but the fruit of the spirit is love and you say come near and come and see the love of god purified love not all this uh, sin they call love in the world that is into fornication adultery we're talking about the purified love of jesus christ and the joy and the peace and the long suffering and the gentleness and the goodness and the faith and the meekness and the temperance against such there is no law and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions and the loss thereof. If we live in the spirit, let us also do what? 
walk in the spirit let's look at uh, first corinthians i'm looking at chapter six there first corinthians chapter six we knew this before we need to know it over and over again that if we're children of god there is a change you are cleansed you are washed you're purified and all those evil things are totally gone if they're still there or if they came back that means you backslid you go back to calvary you go back to the cross and say by the grace of god i'm coming back again and then the blood of jesus will take hold of your life and cleanse you afresh and pour you afresh and purify you afresh and all those evil things that will hinder you from getting to the kingdom everything will get away from your life in jesus name remember once again except a man be born again born of the water of the cleansing water of the word and born of the spirit he cannot see will not see neither will he enter into the kingdom of god but those who are born again they are washed they are cleansed they are made righteous and things are totally different first corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 do you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god be not deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor the effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revilers nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of god you know what we're talking about paul the apostle said you thessalonian believers i'm thanking god for you i'm praising god for you because you are counted worthy to enter into his kingdom and we're saying that those who are going to enter that kingdom are the people that all these things we read about in verses 9 and 10, they are absent from their lives. They've been forgiven. They've been cleansed. They've been renewed. Their lives have become totally different. No more fornication, no more adultery, no more idol worship, and no more effeminacy, and no more abusers of themselves with mankind. That is man and man, you know, doing evil together. And then woman and woman doing, you know, that bad, defiling, terrible, unclean things together. And it says that if you're a real child of God, the grace of God comes into your life, and all that is gone from your life in Jesus' name. And it says, not thieves. The people that steal, and that they steal the money in the house of God, or they steal from their husbands, or from their wives, or from their parents, or they steal from their company, or they steal from anywhere. It says that when we're real children of God, that desire and lust to take what belongs to other people without their consent, all that is gone. There's no covetousness. There's no desire for what belongs to other people. Because if that is still there, you have not been forgiven, you have not been cleansed, and you're not made right your way. It says you'll not get to the kingdom, but we're people of the kingdom we don't steal anymore i said we don't steal anymore because all that covetousness and love of money all that has been taken away and it says covetous or drunkards or revilers or extortioners it says they shall not inherit the kingdom of god look at verse 11 but such was some of you not ah uh, this past tense this gone this is what you were before such was some of you but ye are washed but she has sanctified, but she has justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And it is when you remain clean like that, you remain holy and righteous like that, then the Lord, when he comes, you'll go with him to heaven in Jesus' name. In Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 10. Second Timothy chapter 2, we're reading from verse 10. This ought to be true in your life. This ought to be the testimony of your own life. A new life has come. A new change has come. And because of that new change, you are really born again. In verse 10, look at it. It says, therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It says that those who are saved, they're going to have eternal glory because of that salvation. But now if you are a child of God, you must be a preacher yourself. And whatever persecution you endure, you go out and you preach so that other people who do not know about the salvation of God, they know about that salvation. And it says, it is a faithful sin, for if we be dead with him. Then it says, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Or we'll reign with the Lord. I said, we we'll reign with the Lord. If you don't run away from the persecution, if you don't run away from the church just because of the persecution and the affliction, if you don't say, I'm giving up, 
I can't uh, live the Christian life anymore. I can't serve the Lord anymore. I can't evangelize anymore. I can't do the way, the things of that are righteous. And because you know the posture is so much. The misunderstanding is so much. I can't do it anymore. If you give up, you're giving up your crown. If you give up, you're giving up your reward. You'll not give up your crown. And you'll not give up your reward. But if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, I will not deny him. I said I will not deny him. How does somebody deny the Lord? When you deny the word of the Lord, you deny the doctrines of the Lord, you deny the power, the control, the lordship, and the authority of Christ upon your life, it means you deny him. But when you're holding on to his word and holding on to his doctrine and you're holding on to his lordship, he is my Lord. I am his disciple. I am his follower. I'm going to follow him to the end. That's how not to deny the Lord. But you say, it's too much. I'm giving up. It's too much. My conviction, I cannot live by it anymore. The doctrine, I cannot stand upon it anymore. All the teachings of Jesus Christ, I cannot stand by them anymore. When you deny the doctrines of Christ, you deny Christ. You deny the teachings of Christ. You deny Christ. You deny the authority, the control of Christ upon your life, the lordship of Christ upon your life. You deny the Lord. And those who deny the Lord, he says, he will deny them before his angels in heaven. We will not deny the Lord. I said will not deny the Lord. It says if you deny him, he will deny you. And But then you stand faithful to the very end. Look at verse 13 there. It says, but if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. I will also abide faithful like the Lord Jesus Christ. I said I will abide faithful. I said I will abide faithful. Persecution will come, you will abide faithful. Suffering may come, you abide faithful. And whatever it is, the people of the world are bringing upon your life, you're going to abide faithful in Jesus' name. You, you know, sometimes, apart from the persecution in the world, even within the church, there will be sometimes misrepresentation. They misinterpret what you do. Some people. And they misinterpret your intention and everything. And then this one is talking, and that one is talking, that one is talking, and then you over here, you say, what? I can understand the position in the world, in the church. See what they're saying about me. If you give up because of that, you lose your crown. But if you say, let them say. I said what? Whatever they say, you just say, I'm a child of God. I'm going to keep on living by the conviction that I have. And it is when you continue in that conviction and you refuse to deny the Lord, that's when the reward will come upon your life. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3, verse 4. Revelation chapter 3, verse 4. It says, There was a few names, even in Sardis, I'll be among the few. The few who stand for righteousness. The few refuse to compromise. And the few will not allow all the defilements of the world to ever bring any stain upon their lives. And the few who remain steadfast in the faith and steadfast in the grace of God until the very end when you remain among that faithful few. That's when it says, Thou hast a few names, even in studies, which have not defiled their garments. Did not allow the defilement of adultery, defilement of fornication, and defilement of occultism, the defilement of all society. They don't allow that to come upon them and they keep separate from the things of the world. It says, Those people they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. I pray the Lord will keep you worthy. You see these eternal believers, this is something about them they came into the faith and then they continued in the faith and the Lord is saying if you are going to be worthy of the kingdom on that final day, you come into the faith and then you continue in the faith and the faith is growing and the love is growing and the knowledge is growing and the virtues of the Christian they are growing and your commitment to the Lord is also growing day after day and day by day as you keep on growing like that one of these days the trumpets will sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and then we which are alive will be caught up together with them and they will be forever be with the Lord in Jesus name. I pray you will be there, I will be there, we will be there together on condition we're saved, on condition we keep saved, on condition we remain righteous and holy. He that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Let's rise up and get more of the grace of God again, more of the strength of the Lord again, and let us manifest greater faith in the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord your God. If you're a sinner today, you can become born again. All you need to do is to say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, but I know that you are my Savior. You died for me on the cross of Calvary. 
about it. And I'm believing on you right now. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. I transfer my sins unto you. And I want you to transfer your righteousness unto me. It is that wonderful, mighty exchange that brings the salvation of the Lord upon your soul, upon your life. And then you're able to say, praise the Lord. My sins are forgiven. Praise the Lord. I'm born again. Praise the Lord. I'm a child of God. Praise the Lord. I have the initial grace of God in my life now. And the Spirit of God is bearing witness in my heart. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. That new birth, that new birth, that new creation, that's what happens when you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Allow that faith to grow. Allow that faith to grow. Allow that faith to grow. The faith that brings us to salvation will keep us in salvation. Time of trial, time of temptation, adulterers will try to come and tempt you. Adulteresses will come and try to tempt you. And the idol worshippers will try, will try and tempt you. And the people that want love evil, want to do evil, they have their reasons. They want to tempt you. So that you forsake the Lord. But you say, Lord, I'm going to keep on standing. I'm going to keep on standing. Drunkers might tempt you to drink. And smokers might tempt you to smoke. And gamblers might tempt you to gamble. But you say, Lord, all that is gone. All that is gone. All that is gone. Pray that the Lord will totally cancel all the works of the flesh destroy all the works of the flesh mortify the deeds of the flesh let your spirit become strong while the love of others may be waxing cold you say lord give me your grace to endure to the very end the love of many shall wax cold but he that endureth to the end the same shall be saved in spite of persecution, in spite of trials, in spite of afflictions, he who endures to the end, the same, will be saved. Have all the grace that you need. It's available. Let's come to the throne of grace that we may obtain grace and mercy at the time of need. And then you'll go back home rejoicing. That the grace of God that makes you victorious is now available. Then you go back home with determination, diligence, and a firm decision that by the grace of God, you will not look back, you will not go back.